When it comes to cult classic horror games, few have as rabid a following as Condemned Criminal Origins. Released in 2006 as a launch title for the Xbox 360, Condemned received praise for its graphics, story, and AI. While the game received some criticism for a lack of variety in combat, that didn't stop it from selling well enough to immediately put a sequel into production. But when Condemned 2 released in 2008, it was met with a more mixed reception from fans. While it reviewed better than the first game, it sold far less, and over time fans would come to regard it as something of a misstep for the series. With no PC port and no way to play it on modern consoles, Condemned 2 is kept alive only in the memory of a lingering fan base, remembered as a technically solid follow-up that just couldn't capture the magic of the original game. Condemned 2 changed a lot about the original game. It had an entire overhaul for the game's protagonist, Ethan Thomas, and a darker tone to the story that focused more on government conspiracies than hunting down serial killers. Some levels were regarded as being too divergent from the tone of the first game, and the game's multiplayer modes weren't deep enough to compete with other multiplayer juggernauts at the time, like Gears of War and Modern Warfare. Condemned 2 took a lot of risks, but it remains the last word on the Condemned series more than 12 years later, so it's hard to say how well those risks paid off. But playing the game now, it's not bad at all. In fact, it's an obvious labor of love with meticulously designed combat and environments with plenty of gameplay innovation. It maintains the formula and feel of the original game, but expands on it in interesting ways. Yet without any modern console ports or even a PC port, the game sits forgotten on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, fading into the memory of the game industry. Condemned 2's languishing is a bit of an anomaly for a game that not only expanded the basis structure and modes, but also reviewed better. Far lesser series have managed to continue with far worse reception. To find out why Condemned 2 turned out the way it did, we reached out to the people who would know better than anybody, the developers who made the game. In sitting down with the game's artists, producers, directors, and more, we pieced together a picture of Condemned 2 from conception to launch. Along the way, we uncovered fond memories, canceled ideas, and unfulfilled futures for the series. This is a look inside the development of Condemned 2. No game is perfect. While I myself have a deep love for the first Condemned, it's a game that made a solid foundation for the developers to improve on. But the surprising aspect of Condemned Criminal Origins isn't that it left room for innovation, but that it came out as well as it did in the first place. Quote, I wouldn't say that the original Condemned had shortcomings, especially for a successful 360 launch title that was only in development for like 15 months. There were things that we could have done better or expanded upon, which later became the starting point for the sequel. To be honest, we did very little testing other than QA due to the extreme time crunch we were in on Condemned 1." End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, In regards to Condemned Criminal Origins, making a launch title with a small team and new tech, dynamic lighting and normal maps, while figuring out a new IP with a new genre, first-person melee detective game, was challenging. It was a race to the finish throughout. Like any project, there were issues we had to make peace with and many we addressed. In general, the team was quite self-critical during production, and we devoured every review and forum post after release. Transitioning to the sequel, everyone had a list of improvements to explore, such as adding more depth to the combat, or making the overall experience less claustrophobic. For the latter, we were generally limited to single shadow casting light per scene for performance in Condemned Criminal Origins, which led to the run from light to light feel that many believe homogenized the entire experience." End quote. After Condemned Criminal Origins finished its hurried production, Condemned 2 was thrust into development. I think original production for that probably started within, within a few months, three to six months probably, of when the first game was launched. Um, and they were in pre-production for a while, because again, you know, you, you got to remember, like, the original launch date for this was going to be 2007. So, you know, they had originally projected about a two-year window between launch the first game, do pre-production, go to full production, launch this game, fall 2007. So, 
see, I, I think it was fairly close after the first game launched that they started on that. Of course, for a first-person horror game, the first major point of innovation would have to be the game's combat. Condemned Criminal Origins is often regarded as a pioneer in first-person melee combat, but its simplicity was noted by many critics at the time, which meant for Condemned 2, Monolith went back to the drawing board to make a combat system that was deeper and hit harder than anything else the market had seen. Quote, Increased combat depth is always going to feel more video gamey to a degree. Melee combat was iterated on obsessively throughout production, but my recollection was that most of the time went towards getting the mechanics feeling responsive and satisfying rather than prototyping a bunch of radically different ideas. There was a push to include incentives to throw, and in some cases made it integral to level objectives. Throwing introduced some complexity to level interactions and engagement distances. For the latter, this was generally seen as a plus as it made encounters more elastic and presented more opportunities for player choice. Making sure it wasn't too easy to take out enemies from afar was an ongoing concern." End quote. In an effort to add more variety and depth to Condemn 2, Monolith introduced a new combo system, which moved the game away from the Spartan realism of the first title and more towards rewarding players through accepted gaming conventions. But with Condemned 2, that was exactly the point. Quote, Note that realism was never a goal for any part of the game. Creepy, impactful, and intense would be better descriptors, and this was particularly true for combat. All in all, allowing the player to chain together hits and rewarding them when doing so was common in most melee games, which made it a natural step for us to take in the sequel." End quote. This lack of realism extends even to how the developers prototype the game, and how the combo system started, as noted in a humorous anecdote from animation lead Richard Lico. Quote, From what I recall, he put together a combat pit as a separate mode outside of the narrative. We, team members, would often play the combat pit and try to outdo each other on kills, when we weren't competing in Pokemon Puzzle League, Geometry Wars, or Street Fighter III Third Strike. I believe the combat multiplier came from that playtesting. It was most definitely more gamey. This was corroborated by character lead Scott Shepard, who praised Lico's animation work while discussing Condemned 2's revamped combat. Quote, Realism wasn't really the goal. We felt with the first one, we had the beginnings of something, possibly the best first-person melee combat system out there. We really wanted to continue to develop and expand that into a full-fledged skill-based system that players could spend a lot more time in. We were focused on increasing the fun of the combat system more than anything. Rick Lico, our lead animator on both projects, has a huge passion for fighting games, and he brought that passion and knowledge in helping to develop the combat system in particular." End quote. One of the most impressive aspects of Condemned 2, even today, is the variety and depth of its animation. It's a bit of a cliché to say that game developers put all of themselves into their projects, but in the case of Condemned 2, they literally did. Quote, we were our own mocap actors. If we needed data, we went into our on-site mocap studio, captured a ton of takes, and used it as a rough base for animation. When you're fighting enemies in Condemned, you're literally fighting the dev team. Mostly the animation team. We encouraged many people on the broader team to try acting in the suit. Only a few had the guts. All of the unique characters were keyframe animation. I animated the baby doll, the bear, and many actors as keyframe only. The player was keyframed for gameplay and mocapped for sync actions. Funny story, getting suited up for the mocap can be time intensive, especially back then. So one day, instead of taking the suit off for lunch, I just kept it on. Went to Azteca in a mocap suit and had lunch with the team, and did my best not to spill on the suit. Another funny story, Frank was acting in the suit for Condemned 1. We were getting the base set for the pipe-wielding humans, and Frank insisted on using an actual lead pipe as a prop for authenticity's sake. As the session went on, he got very sweaty. So on one take, while swinging the pipe aggressively, he loses control, slips out of his hand, and it flies across the room, lodging itself in the wall. The look on his face was priceless. And one last story about animation. Once Frank and I got the throw mechanic working, we figured it would be fun to trip enemies by throwing stuff at their feet while running. Got it working, then noticed it created a new problem. How do we make a recoil system for AI on the ground? We couldn't afford to add all that animation content to the schedule or our game memory, but we love tripping fools. The solution? Insta-death when you hit them while they're down. Gamers could have exploited this, but oddly never did. We were thankful." End quote. But Condemned 2's animations aren't just special because the developers themselves made it into the game, 
but because the way they handled first-person animation was so different from anything else at the time. Quote, Cameras in first person are tough. You want motion that makes the player feel like it's their head moving, but you don't want to make them sick. Brian Legge, the engineering lead, and I did a bunch of testing to determine what makes for motion sickness and what's safe to do with the camera. We found that rolling the camera is the fastest path to puke, so don't do it. I discovered that we needed the camera to lead any action, then do the opposite on the action. For example, swinging left to right, the camera would lead to the left and swing right as the arm swung left. They'd align directly forward on the hit frame. This would add impact without causing the player to feel like their aim was off. Everything was so delicate, but over time we got good at it. The player didn't have separate third and first person animations like all other first person games do. We decided to animate the third person and film it with a first person camera. This would lend to more visceral feeling first person combat and saved on memory, which was a big deal in those days. But the compromises we needed to make to have the first person feel good caused the third person to look not so good. So when we added multiplayer later in development, we, the animation team, were nervous. We knew our third person didn't look great and seeing other players meant you'd see how bad it actually looked. But we were too far into development to split the third and first person camera into separate animation. We just did our best to make both look good. For enemies, we did the same thing, though we had less sets. Each enemy needed dramatically more animation than the player. Hundreds of recoils, attacks, evades, jukes, navigation, all unique to a weapon set. This meant that each enemy type was limited on what weapons they'd pick up and use. We had to do this to make sure they felt robust when using a weapon, but also fit into memory. Most enemies shared animations within common body types. We had standard humans with unique male and female animation sets, crawlers, and martial artists, plus a few unique enemies like the bear, baby, big metal guy, etc. End quote. But the difficulty in getting the feel of weapons just right extended to the rest of the project as well. Quote, For the timing, you need enough anticipation to make something feel physical, and condemned games are known for feeling very physical. But the more time between button input and result is bad, so we'd constantly be editing the hit frame to find that sweet spot. The timing needs to be relative to the general game speed, too. If one attack feels good super quick, it may cause the rest of the game to need to speed up so we'd have to constantly balance the individual feel against the tempo of the entire combat system. This meant that individual moves may need to be compensated by design to allow for the overall tempo. I have this theory that if it feels good today, let it rest but come back to it in a few weeks. It'll be obvious what's wrong then and you can easily fix it. Noodling in the moment is like a dog chasing its tail. Producers hate this approach, it's hard to schedule. Of course, all that animation in a game as gritty as Condemned 2 wasn't just for show. Despite the team's insistence that the game wasn't meant to be realistic, that didn't stop it from being shockingly brutal to many players at the time. Condemned 2 was one of the most violent games ever seen on the market, and was even banned in Germany. But were there any killing blows that even the developers themselves deemed too violent to make the cut? Quote, Yes, but not many. We got 42 environmental fatalities in there. I remember a drill press finisher we decided to not go with, we always knew this was an M-rated title, so it was pretty much only limited by budget and time. End quote. Martin Kaplan, associate producer, Sega. Quote, Yeah, we had a few things that crossed the line. I don't want to say what they were, but we had some restraint. Not much, though. It was very brutal. It's funny, though. Hearing this question implies it felt visceral to the player, which was the goal. We had this one animator, Daryl, incredibly creative guy. He did most of our environmental kills. We'd be doing group reviews and Daryl would show what he was working on and the whole team would, ooh, the ideas he'd come up with, he's a creative genius in a disturbing way. Since then, I've lost the taste for violence in games. It's one of the few reasons I'm with Polyarch working on Moss now. I needed a break from the death and the guns. I could never do another Condemned. It's just too mentally taxing to live in that world. End quote. Richard Lico, animation lead. Quote, Although there was always agreement that while we wanted brutality, we didn't want to veer into Mortal Kombat fatality territory. For what it's worth, there weren't many opportunities for humor and we needed an outlet. There was ongoing preoccupation with finding amusing melee weapons like foosball poles or toilet seats, and a lot of doting on the exaggerated sounds that came from clocking enemies with the shovel or the fry pan. End quote. Jonathan Stein, lead level designer. Innovations in gameplay and combat are to be expected when working on a sequel. But the direction Condemned 2 took with its story were anything but what players expected. Condemned Criminal Origins was a taut, 
neo-noir thriller about hunting serial killers in abandoned buildings as an epidemic of unexplainable violence overtook the city. Condemned 2, on the other hand, focused more on building a greater world beyond what the players saw and expanded to a more sci-fi story that included government conspiracies and explicitly supernatural events. Quote, we wanted to expand the universe, but not in preparation for another sequel. I don't think we anticipated there was going to be a Condemned 3. Unfortunately, like most horror-based stories, the more information provided, the less terrifying the experience. The paranormal and the unknown are super powerful tools, but very hard to maintain for extended periods of time. There was a general push to fill in the blanks to make sense of everything. Maybe go as far as tie up all the loose ends. For better or worse, this latter point was probably the primary driver behind expanding the universe over anything else. In my opinion, and I feel mostly responsible for this, the result delivered explanations for things that should have remained a mystery or were basically unexplainable. End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Though in our interview, production coordinator Aaron Giddings indicates that Jace Hall may have planned as far as Condemned 4, even if Monolith had never started production on a Condemned 3. I believe that uh, the, main, the main guy who had kind of written out the story, uh, he, he had a whole plan for at least a Condemned 3, I think probably a Condemned 4 as well. Um, you know, that, that this would have gone through. And, you know, unfortunately with with the way things went, that just that just never happened. Those mysteries, unexplained or no, were reflected in the main character Ethan Thomas. Once a promising detective framed in Condemned Criminal Origins, the Ethan Thomas player's meet in Condemned 2 has been drastically changed sporting a new, disheveled appearance and a more cynical outlook on the world due to the events of the first game. Throughout the game, he struggles with alcoholism and outbursts of anger. It was a different, more raw approach to the character, and despite some fans not appreciating the change in tone that came with it, the developers had plenty of reasons for making the changes they did. Quote, Condemned 2 was very much a story of Ethan's descent into madness. We wanted the player to question how much of this is actually happening versus how much was his own battered and bruised psyche losing a grip on reality. We took that opportunity to explore a lot of fears and fantastical ideas. Different people respond more to some than others. I remember I was a big opponent of the bear scenes in the game. I just didn't see how that was going to work and be scary. But once it was put together and we were able to play it, it was for me a heart pounding experience." End quote. Scott Shepard, character lead. Quote, the main character's transformation between the first and second games was evolutionary. As we grew more comfortable with our tech and working on consoles, the character design followed these advances visually. Who the character was reflected the turmoil of the narrative. In the first game, Ethan was just discovering the dark world around him. In Condemned 2, he was a bit broken as a result. His struggle was internal and manifested in alcohol abuse and to some degree of reckless abandon. We didn't explore changing protagonists, although we probably could have done so without alienating fans. End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, there was a desire to give him some added depth with some flaws. Also, there was interest in having the game mirror his fragile mental state and in creating some tension related to figuring out if threats were real or hallucinations. There were discussions around expanding Rosa's role, but I can't recall specifics. End quote. Jonathan Stein, senior level designer. In regards to changing Ethan's appearance and tone, quote, You know, I don't recall where that decision came from. I do remember it being divisive with the dev team. Some felt like Condemned One's Ethan didn't quite hit the mark, and a darker tone was desired for the sequel. But some felt Ethan was too different in Condemned 2. The choice to replace Greg as the voice actor played a role in the darker tone shift. But I wasn't part of those discussions. End quote. Richard Lico, Animation Lead. Quote, as the story and world of Condemned evolved and developed, we wanted the main character to reflect those changes as well. Bloodshot is a much darker and rougher world than Condemned Criminal Origins, so we needed to have Ethan fit this new paradigm. I don't believe we ever discussed a different protagonist, though there was some talk of Rosa being a playable character if I remember correctly. End quote. Scott Shepard, character lead. Condemned 2 also featured a greater emphasis on first-person shooting which Sega producer Martin Kaplan explains as a choice, quote, more about varying the experience up and giving more variety to gameplay. And since they were on the same engine as the Fear series, having shooter sequences was relatively low cost to add, end quote. 
When it released, Condemned Criminal Origins was praised for its intricately detailed environments that transported players into the dilapidated, crumbling, morally deadened world. Condemned 2 maintained the series' tradition for disgustingly detailed back alleys and abandoned buildings, but the team also took a few chances on more varied environmental ideas, including an abandoned doll factory inhabited by murderous baby dolls, a shootout in a ski resort, and a magic theater. And the creation of these levels was a long process. Quote, in regards to level theming, high level thinking during pre-production, when the decisions are made, was more centered around what environments would be new than concern over a cohesive whole. Getting art cranking was critical early due to the time involved in making environments and our schedule. Everyone submitted ideas. Designers wrote some short prose vignettes with Thomas in different locales. Those that gained traction became final levels. After we had our environments, exhaustive reference was asserted and the story was threaded between them. In production, level design stood up a gray box version with skeletal gameplay to establish flow and scale, and then each designer iterated with the world artist and the audio designer up until the end. Each designer and artist couple was responsible for two or three levels. I can't really speak to the specifics of the Magic Theater or Doll Factory as I didn't work on them." End quote. Jonathan Stein, Senior Level Designer. Quote, we would generally come up with a list and image boards of specific locations or what would be scary environmental situations. Some of the locations were written in from the beginning to be part of the story, like the apple orchard in Condemned 1. We generally kept our ideas concise and focused so there wasn't a lot left on the cutting room floor. If we thought of something scary, we tried to find a way to fit it in. End quote. Casey Burpee, Senior World Designer. Still, there were nascent concerns about the levels and the new approach to the story. Quote, some, myself included, were concerned that the environments, the enemies, and the story felt schizophrenic, or at least not cohesive. On the flip side, this strangeness plays into the, is Thomas going crazy idea. Due to production constraints, nobody ever really felt an environmental swap was an option. End quote. Jonathan Stein, lead level designer. I think there were some good feelings, but also, I don't know, I feel like there was some some internal feelings of like we kind of missed the mark a little bit on this with the direction that the story went and uh, you know, some, some some things like that to get the feel for the areas just right the artist behind condemned 2 would commonly venture into real abandoned buildings but inspiration comes from many sometimes unexpected places Quote, there was ongoing reference gathering, including some photo safaris with the art and design teams, continuing a trend from the first game. We visited a decrepit boat moored in Ballard. One of the world artists and I hit the Timberline Lodge in the middle of winter, which was very influential in defining the look of our lodge. End quote. Jonathan Stein, senior level designer. Quote, well, we went to the Overlook Hotel for image gathering. I personally would listen to bands like Fear Factory and Lustmord to get into the mood while building the levels I was part of. Our environment team would go image gathering to various dilapidated areas in the Seattle area. The old Sunny Jim Peanut Butter Factory, Abandoned Navy Commissary, and the Satsop Nuclear Facility to name a few." End quote. Casey Burpee, Senior World Designer. Speaking of music as an influence, the entire art team took a variety of unique influences for both the Condemned games including films, TV shows, classic horror games, and more. Quote, For Condemned Criminal Origins, Silence of the Lambs and Seven were huge influences, but not the only two. Movies such as Jacob's Ladder, 28 Days Later, and Saw were drawn upon. Other mediums would include deep diving into criminal forensics and serial killers. We weren't trying to simulate the science or actual techniques in these fields, but we wanted to operate off of concrete fundamentals. In the end, gameplay would prevail over realism, but it was a very engrossing world to investigate. These references also carried over to the sequel. On an individual level, each member of the team had their own source material, their own way of getting into the zone. End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, I don't recall too many specific influences for Condemned 2. A lot of it was natural development of the first game. We knew we wanted to go more dark and fantastical, I remember looking at films like Dark City and The Cell for some visual inspiration, as well as some games like Silent Hill. A handful of members of the art team had the album Oceanic by Isis on pretty solid rotation during the development, as that music really fit the mood quite well." End quote. Scott Shepard, Character Lead Of course, like any game, some content wasn't able to make it into the full release. 
Whether due to time, budget, or just not fitting in well in the overall design, Condemn 2 may have packed plenty of crazy, over-the-top moments, but the team had plenty more where that came from. Quote, Many additional levels were considered, but I can't recall options. I think we kicked around the idea of Thomas waking up in a padded cell in a straitjacket when getting defeated in some circumstances. I did a little work on another house in the snow level for an additional SKX encounter, I believe, that we ended up cutting. Wasted work is never fun, but it was the right call. End quote. Jonathan Stein, Senior Level Designer. One of the more amusing pieces of cut content I was able to discuss with developers came from an anecdote from Richard Lico regarding a cut version of the baby doll. Quote, okay, the baby doll. I animated that character myself and had a blast. It had a tiny baby head sewn onto its shoulder. I decided that that was the baby's baby and treated that second head and its arm as another character. The two had a paternal relationship. Mom was very protective of her offspring, so I wove this into gameplay. As I mentioned earlier, you can kick the baby over then pick it up as a weapon. This wasn't originally intended, but I couldn't resist. You could pull its string and use it as a throwing grenade or melee with it. But it was an opportunity for me to have a character stare at you as a player. She'd cover her baby eyes when you block with her, punch you for successfully blocking. She'd act like you're twirling her around like a loving parent would when you swing her. It was very psychological. But we didn't get everything in with her that I wanted. I prototyped her dropping down onto your back. You'd hear her land on you and the camera would shake, but you wouldn't immediately see her. She'd hang out behind the camera for a bit of time. Eventually, she'd creep over your shoulder and get in your face. She wouldn't attack, just obscure your view for a short while, similar to the ink attack in Mario Kart. The doll was emulating the baby she had in her shoulder by perching herself on yours like you're her dad and her shoulder head is your grandkid. From this idea, Frank and I started discussing releasing a line of condemned toys called Shoulder Babies. We thought people at cons would love them, walking around with a creepy baby attached to their shoulders. We obviously never did, and the shoulder feature never made it into the game, but damn it was a fun idea. End quote. Richard Lico, Animation Lead. Even though fans never got to see some of these great ideas be implemented into Condemned 2, the sequel still had its fair share of fan favorite moments, including an infamous chase scene with a rabid bear late in the game. Quote, working on the bear was challenging, but really fun. For whatever reason, it stayed true to its initial concept rather than finding its way and evolving as many of the levels do. It sparked some interesting debate about the appropriate balance of core systems versus one-offs in terms of production. When someone sent me a link to the holy crap that's a bear video from Justin TV, I nearly crapped myself, end quote. Justin Stein, Senior Level Designer. Quote, I liked the part with the bear. It was even better when watching Studio Big Shots take a turn and get scared shitless. End quote. Casey Burpee. The bear came up again from Richard Lico when asked if the team was worried about how the game would be received leading up to launch. Quote, of course, devs are often way more self-aware than public perception implies, but worry means that you are bold enough to take risks, to try new things and find the heart of a project. Risks are called risks because they don't always work out as planned, and everyone was aware of this fact. Take the bear for example. If you were to ask someone after playing Condemned 1 what they're looking forward to from a sequel, they wouldn't say fighting a bear in a snowy mountain shack. Yet you did that in Condemned 2 and it was thrilling. Some risks work, some don't. We knew we had taken quite a few, but we had fun doing it." End quote. Richard Lico, Animation Lead. Probably the biggest way Condemned 2 differed from its predecessor was the inclusion of multiplayer, where multiple players could connect online to engage in first-person pummeling sessions across a variety of game modes. Though most reviews at the time criticized the lack of depth compared to some other major titles on the market, it was a good bit of fun for fans looking for a change of pace from the single-player story mode. But having failed to gain much of a lasting audience, Condemned 2's multiplayer is mostly remembered now as yet another extraneous mode in the mad rush for multiplayer relevance at the beginning of the Xbox 360 and PS3 era. Quote, We wanted a multiplayer mode as a key feature to compete for attention with those titles, but worked with the team to make sure the game modes were unique in look, feel, and concept to Condemned. Multiplayer was super duper hard to make work technically for the mass market, especially with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Given the time and budget limitations, the Condemned multiplayer was a great achievement. No DLC was planned as far as I was aware, though the studio could have produced them given a budget to do it." End quote. Martin Kaplan, Associate Producer quote, There was a small team put together specifically to design and build the multiplayer component of the game. 
The team knew what they were doing and in a lot of ways exceeded everyone's expectations. Initially, we were concerned that the Heart of Condemned was not conducive to multiplayer, but the modes they came up with were quite fun and innovative within our universe. However, we were not under any illusion that we were revolutionizing multiplayer to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with top multiplayer games at the time. The team size and resources allocated simply didn't support that notion. Of course, we hoped to create something special that grabbed people's attention and would help extend the life of the single-player game. While the multiplayer team worked quite autonomously, they were fully embedded in the team and worked closely with all disciplines." End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, At the time, multiplayer felt like a requirement for a full-priced game. We looked at it as a way to give players an additional way to continue enjoying the game when the campaign was finished, though it was never thought to be the primary focus for the game in the way that it might be for Call of Duty and Halo. We also felt that we could do something pretty different and interesting that people hadn't seen before, which is always exciting." End quote. Scott Shepard, Character Lead Condemned 2 was developed at a different time for the game industry, with a team notably smaller than most modern AAA productions. Some things in the industry, like the persistence of crunch, never change. In the modern industry, we've seen no shortage of stories about developers working from their desks upwards of 15 hours a day, regularly being robbed of overtime and being forced to quit the industry due to burnout, PTSD, or worse. Though almost no team goes unaffected by crunching game development, it thankfully seems like the team behind Condemned 2 managed to bypass the worst possible outcomes. Quote, Development was relatively smooth with a bit of crunch at the end. Delaying a game is a death nail for a lot of studios, so we weren't about to take that chance. Our team also really enjoyed the product we were creating, so staying late made for great camaraderie. In hindsight, I think a little more time to polish the end levels and set up the story for a sequel would have paid off in spades, but that's just the game development life." End quote. Casey Burpee, Senior World Designer Quote, I crunched hard during my time at Ravensoft. My son was one at the time I worked on X-Men Legends, and I barely ever saw him. I believed at the time that it was a necessary part of the business and that pain is temporary, but art lives forever. What an idiot I was. I'll never get those early days with my son back. And for what? X-Men Legends? Terrible trade. So during Condemned 2, I was acutely aware of this mistake. Neither I nor my team would sacrifice their families for a product. Fortunately, the animation in Condemned 2 reviewed well." End quote. Richard Lico, Animation Lead. Quote, yes, both Condemned 1 and 2 launched on time. A real accomplishment that often gets overlooked or forgotten as time goes on. And of course, the consumer doesn't really value this the same way publishers do. The team did crunch, and we ate a lot of pizza, but it wasn't off the charts, at least for most people on the team. I don't want to minimize the efforts of those who did put in an exorbitant amount of work and didn't receive any recognition. There are a lot of unsung heroes in game development." End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Though like in most cases with Crunch, it took its toll on some team members more than others including production coordinator Aaron Giddings, who left the game industry a few years later. I was having, uh, it's fine, I was actually having lunch with my, uh, my, daughter, my oldest daughter today, uh, who's 13, and kind of made the offhand comment, yeah, you know, I used to do cool stuff for a living. Um, but that's, that's honestly, it, and then she reminded me, she goes, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. I got to go test a couple of games, but you were also gone a lot. And your job wasn't that stable, Daddy. And that's the thing, like truth be told, um, when I exited, that's basically why is I have five kids. And uh, you know, at, at the time in 2015, my oldest was 10 and my youngest was two. And my oldest is 14 and my youngest is six. Um, and the exit honestly had a lot more to do with, I didn't want to do crunch anymore. And I wanted a little more stability. With so many late nights, pizza runs, and spending years polishing and innovating on a collaborative project, it's no surprise that the Condemned 2 team also made a fair amount of happy memories along the way. Quote, when I think of my favorite memory working on Condemned, because over time both games have blurred together, it's the thrill of working on a console launch title, which was the case for Condemned 1. That energy, focus, and unified commitment to a common goal by every person on the team was and remains unparalleled. End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, 
I have nothing but fond memories of my time on the Condemned team. It's actually sad to me that we didn't get a chance to make more entries to the series. When I was interviewing, I was so impressed. I thought I was made for this game, and I told them they absolutely had to hire me. I think my excitement alone landed me that gig. Monolith was and still is one of the best studios to work for. End quote. Casey Burpee, Senior World Designer. Quote, Overall, it's still some of the most fun and creatively satisfying times I've had in this industry. The team was solid, and I miss working with most of them. Matt Allen and Frank Rook were incredible mentors. The animation team was stellar. Anyway, Condemned 2 wasn't perfect, but we were all proud of it, especially when considering the team size being as small as it was. It had better melee combat than the original, a lot more creative characters. Sure, some risks didn't pay off, and some elements may have deviated too far from the source. I personally pushed for some of the more fantastical elements, which, in hindsight, doesn't fit the perception of the universe well. And I wish we would have gone more freeform with the detective tools, more like Arkham Asylum did. But we did what we could with a small team on a limited budget. I respect the hard work and passion everyone dedicated to it." End quote. Richard Lico, Animation Lead. Industry crunch is bad and industry crunch sucks, but at the same time, you know, looking back, and I've been in crunch at a lot of different companies over the years, but it's, it's funny, like looking back, um, like that kind of 2007 through 2009 window at Monolith, as much as it was brutal, like there are times when I kind of miss it. Um, and, and looking at, thinking about some of the people who were on those teams, like that was such an all-star team. And some of those people have been together since the original North uh, series, and you know, it was just it, it was a it was an amazing time to be there, and, and I kind of miss it sometimes. It, everybody put their shoulder to the grind to, to the wheel, and just you know we were all there together, kind of thing. Everybody was working the same late nights and eating the same pizza. Quote. It was a great team. I'm still friends with many of those guys today, even though we've long since moved to different projects or companies. Art reviews with the character team were mostly about trying to gross each other out with whatever cool thing we were working on at the time. One thing I always laugh about is that while we were working on these sort of horrific, very dark, very brutal games, the games we played in the office were predominantly Guitar Hero and Pokemon Puzzle League. I think just working on really dark stuff when we needed to take a break, we wanted something light and fun." End quote. Scott Shepard, character lead. Quote, Beyond the cliffhanger ending in Condemned 2, no significant work was ever really started on another installment, to my knowledge. After the game shipped, everyone took some much-needed time off, and then most either went on to Fear 2 or left Monolith. That's when I departed, but there are a few Condemned folks still at Monolith that might be in the know about subsequent efforts. While I really enjoyed working on the game and with the team, we're all in different places now mentally and physically. I'd be most interested in seeing what fresh eyes might bring to the franchise." End quote. Jonathan Sign, Senior Level Designer. After Condemned 2's completion, most of the team would move on to working on Fear 2, but production coordinator Aaron Giddings explained that at the time, there were actually two Fear games in development at Monolith. I don't know, I feel like there was some, some internal feelings of, like, we kind of missed the mark a little bit on this with the direction that the story went and uh, you know, so, some, some things like that. Um, I think the other hard thing was like almost as soon as Condemned shipped, um, almost everybody from that team got rolled into the Fear 2 team. So like it went from push, push, push to get Condemned 2 out the door to well, you're still, you know, grinding away because we got to get Fear 2 out the door, too. There was a point um, in Condemned to Development where Monolith was actually trying to have three titles in development. And, uh, yeah, that, the, the, it was going to be Condemned 2 and then two different uh, fear titles uh, and then the two fear titles got rolled into one because we just did not have enough team for for three titles at all 
one of them was going to be uh, totally console specific um, and kind of be a, a fierce spin-off almost. And then uh, at, at the time when that was in planning, then Fear 2 was going to be very, very much the sequel uh, and be very PC focused. Of course, after reminiscing about their 12-year-old project, I felt that it was only fair to ask what they thought of Condemned 2 looking back, and more importantly, if the series still had a place in the modern gaming landscape. And I have, I, I have to admit, I think original Condemned is a stronger game than Condemned 2. Um, but, I mean, my overall feeling is, like, I'm proud of the game, I'm proud of the part I had in the game. Um, I think... I think we made a strong game. It wasn't necessarily the direction that that, that people expected, um, but I honestly I wish it I wish it had done better because I I would have liked to have seen what the next step um, in that story would have been. Quote: I feel good about what we created. Sequels can be tough, and in the end, it accomplished what we set out to do. It's difficult to get a current perspective on the game since it was a 360 title, but perhaps one day a remaster will get made. I'm a huge fan of remasters and typically feel all 3D shooter games should be remastered. It's a genre that can really benefit from higher fidelity without making any compromises to gameplay." End quote. Frank Rook, lead game designer. Quote, I remember how much we were all learning. When we started Condemned Criminal Origins, normal maps were just becoming a thing. We were suddenly doing high poly modeling during a time when the tools to accomplish that weren't nearly as advanced and user friendly as they are now. I'm definitely proud of what we accomplished. Looking back, I've always wanted a hybrid of the two games, the combat system and visual quality of the second one, with more of the tone and story of the first. I think the first game created such amazing tension, where the second one made you feel like so much more of a badass. Those two goals are difficult to reconcile, but it would be so great to see a condemned with both." End quote. Scott Shepard, character lead. Condemned 2 is a game that, while it seemed to sell well enough to keep Monolith profitable in between releases, it feels like it never got its proper due. The lack of any way to play it on modern system makes it hard to maintain a legacy in the same way Condemned Criminal Origins has, which has ports available on Steam and Xbox One. It's mostly remembered as a bizarre misstep that changed the characters too much or went off the deep end and explained too much of its story. But looking back, and with the additional insight of the game's developers, it's clear that even if they didn't always personally like the directions the game went in, they all knew what exactly they were doing. Twelve years later, the more bizarre aspects of Condemned 2 have become part of its charm. Good artists always want to push boundaries, both for themselves and the things they make. Game developers are no different. Monolith didn't just want to make the same game again, they wanted to build on it and take the formula to new, unique places that were as fun for the players to experience as it was for them to create. For all its pulpy storytelling and edgy aesthetics, Condemned 2 is rightfully able to stand alongside Criminal Origins as an innovative, engaging, and satisfyingly creepy horror adventure. Here's hoping players will be able to experience both games on modern systems sometime in the future. These games deserve to have the legacy they've earned. <laughs>